the flavor of the year which has actually threatened our existence on covid 19 diabetes and i don't think if orthopedic uh, societies have covid session so esd obviously had a covid symposium and uh, i i'll direct it to dr joshi he's been on the task force for covid in maharashtra and has seen it on very close quarters so do you think that, that they they are now saying that diabetes is not only a risk factor for adverse outcomes following covid but also people are getting more infected if you have diabetes and the impact of statins there seems to be reduction in mortality if you using statin in covid patients so what what's your take uh, dr joshi so i think uh, you know in the diabetes space uh, clearly if you just look at mumbai city you know mumbai city has more covid than whole of china so our publication output is 100 or 1 1000 that of china that is the tragedy because of, of of database and the sheer numbers which have overwhelmed our healthcare systems even today you know uh, you know you'll not believe it uh, you know whole night yesterday i was struggling to get beds for my patients so this is the challenge which covid still even now poses maybe suja is a little luckier or bipin but i think amrish in delhi also may have be, be, you know in similar way and this is the this is the challenge so let me get into diabetes and covid uh, in mumbai city uh, we just looked at mortality uh, number one is hypertension number two is diabetes It's very clearly there and in the comorbidities uh, 51% of mumbai girls who died from covid from day 1 to now uh, it was hypertension and 50% was diabetes so that's a very large proportion of the population which has diabetes and dr mohan did this elegant icmr in depth study in the mumbai cohort you know the general prevalence of 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 diabetes is 15% hypertension is 30% so if you look at general prevalence of hypertension and diabetes from the the data published around 10 years back and then you move into the covid space diabetes actually has an amplified uh, you know severe disease and mortality in sheer numbers if you just pick up the sheer numbers uh, diabetes definitely leads to a severe version of covid whether diabetes per se is a covid risk factor is still an unanswered question i know it's very controversial but it's still an unanswered question because if you are well controlled diabetic independent of age and independent of 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 other comorbidities and independent of obesity whether it would would really have that amplifying effect we don't know so that that's still an unanswered question and i don't think ehd gave any insights into that uh clearly more severe covid higher mortality or higher morbidity more likelihood to need more oxygen more likelihood to get more hypoxia more likelihood to get a longer ventilator time longer length of stay longer need for oxygen all these factors are clearly there uh, response to therapy in in diabetics on the various research more therapies i don't think there is a single therapy uh everything in covid is experimental uh with diabetic population the response is weaker or poor that so these are clear things anti diabetic drugs now are being looked at repurpose drugs in covid space whether it is metformin whether it is gliptin whether it is even a agl2 inhibitor like dapa they are being repurposed and we don't have data on that but very likely metformin will have an impact probably gliptins might have an impact possibly i am very excited to look at the dapa trial which might also have a impact in some degrees and i agree with sujay that it's a kidney drug these are smart diuretics and much more than what they say endothelial effect because a lot of covid with diabetes is endothelitis and therefore there it's a it's a coagulopathy but there's thrombo inflammation and in diabetics there is already pre existing in non covid space thrombo inflammation and which is why most of our diabetics in type 2 diabetic space already are on a low dose aspirin and statin and that is why whatever we saw is translated evidence that statins probably might have a a a a role to reduce morbidity and mortality in the covid space with diabetes so i think this is something which is known in the non covid space is getting documented in a covid space so i think statins and low dose aspirins uh, in fact in our maharashtra protocol from day one have been there because we knew that our comorbidities are higher and i think we need to continue that and that's what ehd has only shown us through evidence uh, we still need we still are in research mode in covid but diabetes is a huge problem in india we are probably the second largest country in the world with diabetes but 
you know, in terms of prevalence, Middle East is much more than us. And they have not seen in their COVID space diabetes up the pecking order. United Kingdom has seen it very high in their pecking order. Uh, the underprivileged populations in United States have again seen diabetes up in their pecking order. And in India, clearly we are seeing that. The other challenge with COVID and diabetes is a lot of use of biologics and steroids. And therefore, the very high hyperglycemia as you get in eight, week two, week three of COVID space. And I'm sure all, all, all the panel members will agree with me that that hyperglycemia, COVID, post-COVID diabetic hyperglycemia, uh, which is often tending to, uh, you know, near ketoacidotic-like situations or hyperosmolar state-like situations is not unusual. And the need for high doses of insulin also is not unusual. So that's, that's my take on COVID and glucose and diabetes and statins. But I think, you know, statins, it is prudent common sense that if you have a, a, a cardio metabolic or, or any vulnerable group, uh, which, which has hypertension or diabetes, uh, keeping them on a low-dose aspirin with statin, or sometimes in the second week, a NOAC and statin might be an order of the day in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sethi, your, your comments on, on what was presented in the ESD symposium? Now, actually, I would concur. There was a study which said that pre-operative use of statins decreased post-operative cardiac events in the general population. So if that is the benefit that can occur in a general population pre-operative administration of the statin, then in a situation where you have got some prothrombotic stage, you've got inflammation going on, it is possible that it might be healthy. But while I say so, there are studies either way for every molecule. If you remember what was the controversy for ASN or for ibuprofen, then there are some people who say that this molecule is bad, this molecule is good. So we are picking up some pieces of the maze and projecting it as the evidence. But it is good to know that at least we do not have to discontinue statins in this study. There is a study which said the statins for harm. So I don't think the final word is yet out because we, it is like coffee. Coffee is good for health, coffee is bad for pancreas, coffee causes this, coffee causes that. So I think everybody is having a headache in trying to project their hypothesis and depending on the hierarchy that they are, they have to sell accepted or reject. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mittal, yeah, your comments on it, please. Yeah, as, as Shashank was talking, I was trying to dig out. We've just analyzed 413 consecutive patients, uh, moderate to severe. Uh, few mild, some healthcare workers, but bulk were moderate to severe. Uh, and uh, uh, the data is not out yet. It's just, just a text message from my younger colleague that out of which 152 were diabetic. So, which means that out of 35% roughly uh, of the hospitalizations in, in, at our center, of 400, there have been so many, there have been thousands, but we just managed to profile 400 properly, actually did have diabetes. And although we haven't done, that has already been done, but I don't have it with me, quite clearly the outcome in diabetes is clearly, clearly worse. So, uh, that's one part. Uh, about the use of various drugs uh, for, for diabetes, I think it is important that we realize that we don't have to make any major changes in treatment. At the moment, this is my uh, uh, sort of uh, interpretation of the data. They don't have to drop any drug. This drug is causing harm. This drug could cause that. I would just stick with whatever controls the patient. The moment you move to severe cases, you obviously are on insulin infusion or basal bolus therapies and all that. It's a different story altogether. And if you move to steroids, then it's a nightmare. And we are really dealing with that every day. COVID per se is causing severe hyperglycemia and then you give steroids and then, you know, those patients, and let me make this comment here because those patients after discharge, I mean, it's, I have had patients who two months, I mean, now they're beginning to settle into their normal rhythm. These are not those who went in with A1Cs of 10. Those are the worst off. You start with an A1C of 10 and then you get steroids and all, then it's a different story. But even those whose A1C in March was 6.4, 6.1, and I'm still struggling to get them back down, uh, it take, it's taking a long time and they're feeling miserable. And sometimes I feel that, you know, because in their anxiety and the all good intentions of trying to fix this disease, we are probably using a lot of drugs. And I don't know how much of the post COVID is somewhat linked to our 
anxiety to treat our patients well uh, with multiple molecules uh, rather than uh, you know any one and and therefore uh, i i definitely feel that some of the effects that i am seeing post covid are linked to uh, just you know multiple drug usage to save a life at that point the important point i will make and most of the points about diabetes have been well covered uh, is that the concept that uh, of a syndemic and if you look at uh, yesterday i think richard horton wrote about it but <coughs> syndemic is a concept where you talk of a dis- not just a pandemic it's beyond that it's a pandemic of infection which is taking a toll on the whole ncd system so it's actually a w- also a warning that if you don't manage your ncds well then you will get more and more effects of a pandemic like this so which means that supposing supposing is a really bad scenario there is no vaccine that appears and we have to live like this for 3 years maybe not just few months or one year uh, you know then we re- and we haven't focused on the ncds on our diabetes hypertension as we haven't most we have tried countries have tried india has also had a, so many efforts but it's a huge challenge so so the issue is that the actually the whole thing if you don't have ncd let's say then you're getting scot getting you know not getting much affected by covid it's, the outcomes are pretty good i mean i'm exaggerating but by and large you could say that so to to manage a pandemic you need to manage ncds first that is the concept of a syndemic and i think that's something that's a relatively newish word but i think that's where uh, we need to look at the overall connection between diabetes hypertension and covid and not just as a virus that has come and affected our patients thank you so much dr but gosh uh, uh, also something about covid induced pancreatopathy in, uh, what do you think it's, it's it's a new entity it is going to stay right. is it a form of stress hyperglycemia or something else okay uh, continuing from where professor mittal left off you know the the calcutta municipal corporation i've been actually working with them there is 164 wards in in my city we've actually employed eight people per ward to go door to door to try and identify people who have these ncd comorbidities so we are in the process of creating a registry of that and we are providing a helpline number as well as a free teleconsultation and a free web consultation so that we manage their ncds better management of comorbidity is very very important during these times and and maybe diabetes per se is not that important because you know the word diabetes actually encompasses a lot of things not just the hyperglycemia it could be diabetes related kidney disease it could be the diabetes related heart disease so all of that is actually making things worse and if you look at the total number of people who've come into our hospitals with covid with diabetes it's somewhere around 30 35% but normal hospital occupancy if you look at has diabetes of 30 35% so it's not that i think that the diabetics have actually you know done very badly in term or maybe the, they are getting the infection more but it's just that once they get it because of the other associated comorbidities and the other problems of uncontrolled hypoglycemia they might be having poor outcomes and the good news is that there is at least some data to suggest that irrespective of you having diabetes if your glycemic control is good yes if your comorbidity control is good your outcome is same as someone without diabetes without those comorbidities so that's that's the positive bit of things to look at and therefore you know we've got to be aggressive and like all of the previous speakers said i think we've been trying to chop and change too much let them stick to what they were on on what they were controlled on if they were controlled on rather than you know saying you know this shouldn't be used that shouldn't be used of course probably sglt2 might be an exception in uh, particularly an individual with yeah. uh, caught the infection though dr joshi was talking about the dare 19 study in fact but uh, the corporate hospital that i go to is one of the centers for dare 19 study of data we flows it but that's still too theoretical for the primary care physician or the physician at large to think of the data in terms of involvement of the pancreas and involvement of the liver what happens to diabetes with covid or what happens to hyperglycemia as a result of covid per se so two or three things have been postulated to happen one there could be a direct effect on the beta cell with beta cell dysfunction and people presenting with type 1 like diabetes fortunately or unfortunately i haven't seen anyone like that as of now in this period of time 
I have had newly diagnosed type ones, but you know they have had the typical antibody positivity, low C C peptides. Not that I have known that they've had COVID. I've even gone and done a COVID antibody to try and figure out whether it was related to COVID. I've not seen that. In terms of you know severe insulin resistance, yes, I have seen people who've come into the hospital because you know the steroid bit came in. The story came in late. Initially, not everyone was getting treated with steroids, but even at that point of time, I found significant insulin resistance in some of the patients. Absolutely, absolutely. And and like Professor Mittal was saying, you know, even after people have so-called got well, he was gone. People have gone back home. Things settle down for everyone. You know, something's wrong somewhere. You know, uh, they're not feeling well. And, and you know the so-called post-COVID state. I know it's very vague and difficult for me to define, but people have not gone back to normalcy. And and then if I look at people who who I saw say maybe three and a half four months ago, maybe they are now settling down. And I don't think I can put it down entirely to stress. I don't think I can put it down entirely to stress. Something has gone wrong somewhere. Maybe some data will come up later on to explain what went wrong there. Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Mithil. Yeah, yeah Rajiv, uh, two important points. I think this is great because now we're really talking with a fair degree of experience about this condition as compared to three months ago. And, and I do think that I have two broad kinds of patients. They are the ones who are relatively free of comorbidities. A1Cs are well controlled. It's like a breeze for them. They don't even know. I mean, they sometimes they have a one day fever, half day fever, and you keep monitoring them from home. They put them under home care and they're fine. Nothing. No. But the ones who cross that line, ones who go into moderate to severe disease are typically, I mean, there are exceptions, you know, the statistics, but typically are the ones who are sicker and I'm, they get into quite a jam. And the other thing, I just got the data of those 15 who died in our 415 or 20 patients, uh, 12 were diabetic. So, so I mean, you know, the proportion. What about uh, the comorbidities, sir? I, I mean, we're looking at that. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. renal function. That, one, that one, probably would be. Yeah, yeah, but I'm just saying, I'm, uh, you know, uh, I can give you some data, but it's all really a uh, WhatsApp data. Yes. <laughs> it's not just being analyzed. 164 had hypertension. Okay. 152 had diabetes, 36 had established CAD out of 415 or something. 25 had, had known respiratory disorders. 12 had CKD, established CKD, like pre-admission. So we'll look at all that carefully. But just to give you a sense of what we are seeing. 